Hey, yo, is this thing on? All right, what up? It's Rutherford here. We got another lesson coming at you. This one is about why do we eat? So we had our last one of why do we breathe, and we got some review over here for that. Breathing gets oxygen into the lungs with the diaphragm. Oxygen then diffuses into the bloodstream via the red blood cells, specifically the hemoglobin protein holds that oxygen, and then the heart pumps throughout the body. Oxygen goes to the mitochondria where cell respiration occurs, ATP synthase making ATP our energy molecule to power all of the enzymes, which are proteins that do work. And if you can't do work, you can't do much. So now we're gonna talk about the other thing that needs to go into the mitochondria, which will be an energy source. Oxygen is only part of the equation. We also eat for energy, right? So why do we eat? We eat to get energy so that we can get ATP to power the enzymes, but we also got to eat so we can get the macronutrients, proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids to actually do something with the energy of ATP that we have, AKA building all the structures within the cell, organelles, working proteins, structures, so that we can have functioning cells. Without macronutrients, we are nothing, literally an empty void, okay? So our macronutrients, there are four proteins, carbs, lipids, nucleic acids, and they are all made up of the top six elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are called chomps. You can't pronounce it, but it's a great way to remember it. These chomps, top six elements, are rearranged in different ways to make up the different macromolecule categories, okay? First, we like to talk about carbs. Now carbs give energy. Specifically, that energy is best used for the body. We wanna exercise, we wanna eat carbs so we can have energy the next day to do some sort of exercise or physical activity. Sugars give us quick energy, right? Which we know we feel with a sugar high, right? And that energy from the carbs can enter the mitochondria as a glucose molecule. Now there's plenty of different types of sugar, glucose, um, fructose, maltose, lactose, galactose, okay? All of these are converted into glucose so they can enter the mitochondria for cell respiration. Now, lactose, the one we get from milk, is specifically broken down by lactase. Lactase being an enzyme, a protein that does work, okay? Now, that lactose is present in milk as a starter product for animals that, mammals specifically, that need help getting started in life, okay? So we have the milk that gives us the lactose and gives us all of the other macronutrients that we need and we produce the enzyme lactase early on in our life to break that down. Now, later on in our life, once you get teeth and you're able to walk and find different food, you move on to the other food sources plants and animals, okay? Those food sources give you your chomps, you chomp on your chomps, you get your macronutrients, proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids, because if you are eating something that's living, like broccoli or chicken, those things are living. They are living things, and therefore you will get the chomps, you will get their proteins, you will steal their carbs, their lipids, their nucleic acids, okay? When we say lipids, we mean fats. Those fats, stored energy, are another energy source that we can put into the mitochondria. And that is a much better energy source for our brain. We all know that sugars don't necessarily allow our brain to function very well, but it is the fats, the lipids, that really we can sustain brain energy for a long period of time, especially when we're running low on food or we can't find food, which is really normal for every animal on the planet for forever and ever and ever before there were grocery stores and modern agriculture. So for two million years, homo sapiens have been evolving, right? In an area where food is scarce, food is difficult to get, and you don't know when your next meal is. And so relying on fats as an energy source, a long-term stored energy source is really good for our brain to still be able to function and our bodies can still function well, just not at like peak performance, right? And so, but in the last 10,000 years, human beings started agriculture. Agriculture makes sugar much more common than it was. For the longest time, sugar was rare for Homo sapiens, okay? That's like finding fruit, finding honey, being able to eat the honey. That is a very rare thing, which is why sugar is so addicting, because it's supposed to be rare. It's not supposed to be something that you get 
three times a day, five times a day, every single day for your entire life. Okay, which is why we have so many problems with sugar and problems with sugar addiction is because the addiction was evolved in Homo sapiens in an environment when sugar was super rare and you'd want to be addicted to that, right? But it's too much energy, too much energy for the body. And so that extra energy is going to be converted into stored energy because we're waiting for a time when we run out of food, right? But if you never run out of food and you're constantly eating all types of energy, then we just end up with a ton of extra stored energy, that fat there, okay? Now, I said the carbs, sugars specifically, are broken down by enzymes. Now, enzymes do all sorts of work. Specifically, they, you know, here, lactase breaks down lactose, salivary amylase breaks down carbs, but there are tons of other enzymes. They are the things that do all of the work inside of the cell. So we're breaking things down and making things. We make things, we break things down. That's pretty much what happens inside of the cells. We can all boil it down to that, and that's done by enzymes, which are proteins at work. Now, we have other proteins, like hormones, which are signals, and they end in in, own, and n, testosterone, estrogen, oxytocin. Those are signals. That's communication, because we need coordination and communication throughout our bodies, right? The one that makes us hungry is called ghrelin. When our stomach is running low on fuel, it is going to release and make the hormone ghrelin, and that tells the brain that we're hungry, then we get into motion and try and find that food. Now, the other type of protein, the third type, I like to call structures, okay? Now, the structural proteins typically end in in. Our most famous structural protein is actin. And actin works in our muscles, but it also works all throughout every cell, every structure in here to give our cells structure, okay? Now, these three types of proteins are all made by the ribosome. The ribosome is an organelle, a very small organelle, very basic organelle inside of the cell that is going to make proteins. Now there's all different types of proteins, as we see, that does everything in our cell and is the structure within our cell and the communications between our cells. So have, making proteins is pretty freaking important. The ribosome is the guy that makes them, but doesn't have all of the recipes memorized. So the recipes for how to make the proteins, that lies in DNA. DNA and mRNA are in the nucleic acid category. That is our fourth macronutrient category, and the DNA being the permanent instructions to make proteins, the mRNA being the temporary instructions that are allowed to leave the nucleus, and it is the mRNA that actually goes to the ribosome that is going to make all of the proteins, okay? So our nucleic acids here, are kept safe inside of the DNA if you are a eukaryote or safe inside of the nucleus. The DNA instructions to make proteins, so important to be able to make those proteins to do work that the DNA is kept safe inside of the nucleus if you are a eukaryote. However, that is a new invention. A, the first things that evolved, prokaryotes or bacteria, they have a very short life because they don't keep their DNA safe. Okay, but they evolved first and their technique for living is short life, but reproduce fast. Don't keep your DNA safe, but reproduce fast. And look, it's working pretty well for them. They're small, but man, they can live all over the planet and they are super resilient. Eukaryotes evolving second said, hey, let's keep this DNA safe. Let's wrap this thing up in a membrane called a nuclear membrane. And that membrane is going to keep that DNA safe, protected from radiation or viruses or attacking any other attacking organisms. And you keep that DNA safe, you can live a lot longer. That's for fungi, plants, and animals, which we call fun planimals. Okay? Now, that membrane is made out of one of our macronutrients, the lipids. The lipids make up membranes. And our favorite lipid, the phospholipid, is what makes up the phospholipid bilayer which is every single membrane in our cells. So the membrane around the nucleus, phospholipid bilayer. The membrane around the cell, cell membrane, it's a phospholipid bilayer. The outer membrane of the mitochondria, phospholipid bilayer. The inner membrane of the mitochondria, okay, you get the idea, phospholipid bilayer. So we have all of these little jellyfish, okay, with a phosphate head, lipid tails, lined up together, dividing the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell, the inside of the nucleus from the outside of the nucleus. This compartmentalization allows you to keep things safe, keep things organized, and as we know, that's super important, okay? So this is a zoomed in picture of one of these phospholipids, 
and it has a phosphate head that is hydrophilic. That means it's polar, it is charged, and it likes water. It has a lipid tail, that's where, that's why we need lipids. The lipid tails are hydrophobic, they are uncharged, they are neutral, they don't really like water, they are hydrophobic, okay? And that is because water is a charged molecule. And as a charged molecule, that means that it is both negative and positive, meaning that if you are negative, the positive hydrogen side of water is going to pull you. And if you are negative, or if you're positive, the negative oxygen side of the water molecule will pull you. So either way, you're gonna get pulled by water. And when I say pulled by water, that means like dissolved, ripped apart. So this is salt, this is sugar, this is virtually everything on the planet, okay? Because most things are charged. Most elements have some sort of a charge, okay? Except lipids. And our lipids here have the structure just like this, which kind of looks squiggly, and specifically like this with our lipid tails. That is our phospholipid that does not want to interact with water. And that is the whole basis of life because when you have these phospholipids arranged in a bilayer these lipids are trying to stay away from water the phosphate heads try and interact with water that separates the inside water of the cell from the outside water of the cell the inside from the outside and as soon as you create a barrier then things can start to interact inside of the cell and then life becomes available so your prokaryotes and eukaryotes they both be having a phospholipid bilayer. They both have your DNA instructions to make proteins. They both have your ribosomes to make the proteins, and that's the basis of functioning. And so that's why we eat. Got to get the stuff, got to get the macronutrients so we can build all the structures, whether you're a bacteria or you're a fun plantable.